Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Explore the Extraordinary podcast. My name is Betty, and today I'm joined by Angel. And I am kind of fangirling because I follow Angel on Instagram, and I really enjoy uh, her art. And she's also a near-death experiencer. And I'm really excited that you are willing to come on and contribute to our community at IONS today. And so I'm going to toss it right over to you to introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Angel. That's my nickname. My full name is Angelique Mazel Robbins. I'm 46 years old. I just had a birthday and I spend my time with my family, my little boy. I have a seven year old and I have a 22 year old, but I don't, I don't see him that often. And my husband and I help people walk through life with better skills, better understanding of the things that they're facing, and I create art. And currently I'm learning to play the baritone ukulele. Beautiful. Do you want to maybe go into your near-death experience? Sure. When I was 19 years old, I was on drugs. I was a rave kid, and I had gone to this rave in Cincinnati, hadn't eaten very much and I took a 20 bag of meth, had smoked a bunch of weed and I found the, the guy that I bought drugs from quite a bit and he sold me a pill of ecstasy. I took that pill and then danced all night long and about I don't know, five in the morning, four or five in the morning, not sure exactly what time it was. I went up to him and I said, do you have any more of those pills? And he said, I don't have any more of those but I have these PCP pills and it was a giant horse pill of PCP. And obviously I wasn't in the right mind. So I said, okay. And I took it. And about an hour later, I started having trouble breathing and uh, my heart was racing and I, I was, I was scared. And I told my friend that I was overdosing and she was messed up too. And she kind of laughed and got me some food, but didn't really take me seriously. And then she and the, the other of my friends that were there left the hotel room that we had gone to. And so I was in this hotel room by myself early in the morning and I was in the tub and my whole body started going numb. First, my feet, my legs, and it was like moving up my body where I couldn't feel anything. And then I kept feeling my soul being pulled out through the back of my neck. And I was using all of my might to pull it back in. And it's hard to say how long that went on because I wasn't keeping track of time or anything. But I went into a, a, a different type of space. And I don't know if I had gotten out of the bathtub or if I don't know the the series of events that happened right after that, but I do know that I went into kind of an in-between space and I was praying, you know, I really don't, I really don't want to die. Please help me live, you know, whatever I need to do to continue living, I'll do. And I was met with this giant energy. It was like a tsunami of energy. It was extremely intimidating. And I uh, started having a telepathic conversation with it. And in this, you know, in this space, which wasn't, I'm curious to what I was using to see in this space, because it wasn't these eyes, it was something else. But in this space, I could see this just wall of energy and, and I could feel it. And anything that it wanted to communicate to me, I just immediately had a, an understanding. It was like, just, just download, download. Like, so it wasn't this lapse of time in between being able to communicate something like we all have. And I was going through some type of accountability process where it was being shown to me my lack of appreciation for my, my life 
And so I had this really deep comprehension of my lack of appreciation for my life and felt immediate shame about it and felt stupid, just so stupid that it's like, duh, yeah, this is, this is my life and this is my greatest gift and I've been taking a big crap all over the whole thing. And so I immediately felt remorse and regret and I uh, felt very motivated to change the way I approached life if I was allowed to live. And I was shown my funeral. So it's like I was looking above my funeral that was happening and I could see all of the people there. And I was amazed at how many people were there and how many people were upset that I was dead because I really didn't think that that many people cared about me. And that was a whole nother avalanche of guilt and regret and shame to see and not only see, but I like in these experiences, I could feel everything. So in this accountability process I was going through, it wasn't just like I was observing. It was like I was feeling everything that everyone else was feeling also. And so I was feeling the sadness that that everyone was feeling at my funeral. And, and therefore I could really feel the love that everyone had for me. And it changed my perspective. You know, that this one experience changed my perspective of life dramatically. And of course, eventually I passed out. I don't know what time it was, how many hours it had been, but I eventually passed out and then I woke up when my friends got back and I was changed. I was just, I felt different, like a different person. And I remembered that I had said, you know, whatever is asked of me, I'll do. And of course, the first thing I had said in that experience was I'll quit doing drugs. So I did I quit doing those hard drugs and uh, went through a major <laughs> detoxification on my own. I lived in my own apartment at that time. And my life started really taking on a different color. I uh, got very interested in yoga, started studying the philosophy of Gandhi. I really didn't have any friends for a while except one. And I, <clears throat> I'm just really started to go deeper into my spirituality and why I was here and what my purpose was. And because of that, my life started to feel like it had more meaning. I was, of course, still searching, but I was really looking for meaning. And I also had really weird stuff that started happening to me. Like I worked at a a framing shop I was framing artwork and I was the manager so we did a lot of bulk uh, framing so we didn't have a lot of customers we would have like a few customers that would do bulk orders and I would be framing that stuff all day long and about halfway through the day I would get this just overwhelming feeling of being so tired that I couldn't keep my eyes open and I would crawl up on the the table and pass out just conk out on a flat just hard table and it was really weird because I couldn't open my eyes I couldn't move my body but I could hear what sounded like people all around me doing things and it was very disorienting I would wake up from that about an hour later and wonder who had been in the store and you know it was, it was a very strange and disorienting time that happened to me like every day for a year. And then out of nowhere, I just stopped. But really strange things started happening when I would talk to people. Um, it was like I could feel at least two streams of information from them. So if they were talking to me, of course, I'd be able to take in what they were saying and then I would also actually feel what they were emitting while they were doing that. So it started to be really more and more obvious when someone was 
incongruent. And at first I didn't really understand what was happening because I, that experience is just confusing because we're really used to just taking people at their word and, and going with that and not really used to analyzing, hmm, you know, something that this person's saying isn't sitting right or <laughs> we all have an ability to detect incongruency, but we don't think about it much and we're certainly not taught about it or little. So I started having that experience with people. Um, I started really being able to communicate with uh, people that had passed away. They would just come and talk to me and that was weird. And I started being able to really see into human dynamics and just it's like there's this whole world that's existing with the world that we're in that we're not paying attention to and and I started being able to see it which uh, led me uh, a really interesting experience which I won't go into at this moment led me to a woman that I ended up learning from for over a decade and she was a psychologist who had created her own type of therapy that communed, communicated with the soul and the subconscious while the the conscious mind was in a really relaxed state and she called it the theta state and so there's this special communication that would go on and through a system of numbers and I, she was also a, a Native American shaman. So I learned from her for over a decade and honed a lot of my abilities with her. She's a really amazing teacher. And then in 2012, I had another experience where I got really sick and almost died. And it was like, all of the years where I had really been diligent uh, working with these skills and working with these aspects of myself that I really kind of kept quiet from everyone else started to move into the forefront of my experience and when I was in that near-death experience that the energy that I met had had communicated to me to I asked if it was God I called it God and it said well a better name is which I still do not pronounce wrong, right, and I'm sure German people everywhere will be telling me how I pronounce that wrong, but the it, it means history, which I think is really fascinating that that was the word I was given. It was like, you know, basically telling me quit getting attached to names. You know, this is kind of a, a, a field of, of energy and information that you're just communicating with and experiencing, but Anyway, that energy after I had this experience in 2012 started to speak through me whenever interesting experiences come up where people are wanting to know something that I didn't know or uh, a dynamic needed to be worked with and, and that kind of thing. And so I actually started seeing clients and teaching classes moving into that state. And I've been doing that now for you know 12 years and um that's, that's what I spend my time doing, helping people in that way. I've created two different Qigong forms to cultivate energy in different ways. I've created a, a healing form that I teach others, and I teach people how to see dynamics in the way that I do, along with my art. Love that. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, I was as you were talking, I was like, this is so cool that I get to do this, that I just get to kind of sit here and hold space and listen to people share their most sacred art, let alone the fact that you make tangible art. This is, I feel, a person's most sacred art to share about their spiritual experience. These things are so personal. And I feel like when we are brave and we share them out loud, we give other people permission to share about their own spiritual experiences. I'd love to see if maybe you're willing to share the story about how you met your mentor. I know you said you didn't want to get into it right now, but if you want to take some space to maybe share about that, I'm, I'm really interested to hear it. Yeah, well, yeah, that's one of my most intimate stories. And the reason I've been hesitant to share it online and stuff is that as 
you know, a lot of people like to pick me apart in these type of interviews. And But what happened was during that time where I was, uh, this was, I was 21 years old. So it's two years after I had my near-death experience. And I was just wide open. I just, I didn't understand, you know, I was all different spirits were communicating with me, you know, people that had died, other things. And that was just, I was wide open. And, and in addition to that, I had trauma from the time I was little. I had abuse from the time I was little from um, one of my mother's boyfriends. And so that had people that have that type of abuse, they also have, they're kind of blown open as far as their energetic boundaries. So I was really having a difficult time keeping things out. And I was, I met someone and this person's wife had died a few years before. And as soon as I met him, his dead wife was following me around in my car, um, trying to communicate with me just all the time, really. And one night I had this experience where I was over at my friend's house and I went to the bathroom and as I was sitting on the toilet, it was like my, my body was filled with bricks and I couldn't move. I became so heavy, I, I literally couldn't move, but it, it felt like someone opened up the top of my head and just poured stuff down. And this had happened after an experience of me seeing this person's dead wife and asking her how I could help her. And in that experience of being filled with what felt like energetic bricks, which by the way, I didn't get off the toilet for a long time until my friend came to see if I was okay because I literally couldn't move and she had to help me off the toilet. It's a very strange experience to have your body feel like it's all of a sudden filled with lead and yet physically nothing has happened. So I had memories of a specific person abusing me and that's that's what happened when I was completely filled with this lead. And it was, it made me paralyze. It completely messed me up beyond all recognition. And so where I had started to feel like I was really starting to sort out my life, this came in and just like chopped me to pieces and I became a, an absolute mess. And I, one of my friends said, well, I think I know someone who can help you. And so I started seeing this woman and it took three and a half years, but eventually we figured out that what had happened to me that day on the toilet was that the memories of this person's dead wife had actually filled me up. So I have inside me memories of hers and my own. And the way that we actually figured out that the memories weren't mine. See, these memories were from being an infant. So when you have memories from being an infant, it's really strange. Like things do not look the same and everything's from a weird angle. And so it was very disorienting. But I went into a, a regression type state and was able to name dates and times specific pieces of furniture and that kind of thing and when I when I looked at what was written down of the things that I had said none of it matched my life there was a um, year's worth of difference of when I was an infant and when these memories occurred so I finally figured out that the memories I was having weren't even mine and that's why it was so disorienting and so because of uh, who she was we did a specific type of uh, extraction, we'll say, to get that energy separated from me. And I started to exist in a more normal way again. But that's, that's what led me to her in the first place. Wow, that is so, you know, it's funny, as I'm listening to you, you're opening up so many doors of my own experience that I didn't have language for, or I didn't have explanation for. And then as you're talking, I'm like, Oh, that, that fits, that clocks. So thank you again for your bravery to stand in your experience 
And um, I have so many questions that I want to ask you. <laughs> Our stories are very paralleled, which is, you know, again, another amazing gift of being able to share the experience. But I did hear you just kind of mention something about the backlash of sharing the experience. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit to that about how when we stand in our spiritual truth and we come out and then we kind of get maimed on the internet, what has that experience been like for you? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult because you've got these so many people that feel safe to be jerks um, because they're not sitting face to face with you and they're not really taking in your experience. They're just there to be critical. And it's it's hurtful because it's already difficult to share this kind of thing in this world. This world is very skeptical of these types of experiences. And, you know, I grew up in a religious household, so um, religious people are notorious for saying that everything is evil, everything is the devil. So you can't even talk about like the energy that I met when I died without people saying, oh, it's demons or, you know, saying when I say that, you know, this energy speaks through me, it's like, oh, it's Satan, you know? So it's like, even though I spend my entire life helping people navigate some of the most heinous and difficult things that you can think of navigating and this energy that I've been able to study with since my near-death experience has taught me about true love and how to interact with people in the most loving way possible and and how to integrate all of the the parts of me that were fragmented and and help others integrate themselves and to still have you know people out there saying oh it's demons or whatever or saying your near death experience was just some you know it was just a drug uh, a drug induced hallucination you know and that kind of thing and it's just it's frustrating because I've had drug induced hallucinations, lots of them. I was a drug addict and I did a lot of different drugs. And this was not that. This was something very, very different. And it changed, it changed me through and through. It changed everything about me. It changed my trajectory. You know, I had no, I didn't, this was not my trajectory to basically be a spiritual therapist. That was not what my plan was. So it's I would say it's just, it's really frustrating and it, it makes me gun shy, but I've kind of learned to over the years, I, I take it easier than I used to, but it still just sucks to be misunderstood to such a degree that you're immediately judged for being evil, you know, or the, you know, that there's only one kind of energy in this world that can teach us how to be kind and benevolent and that that exploring our spiritual capabilities is somehow dark and it's like why does all the cool stuff belong to the dark side like why can't we explore what's really here what we're really capable of what our potential is in a, a spirit of openness and in a spirit of of love like why is that always turned to dark and and why, if I don't say the name Jesus, is does that mean that I am, you know, not a Christian for one? How how people always assume, oh, you're not a Christian because you have this experience with Gashikta and you know you channel and all this stuff, and it's like how the self righteousness drives me crazy. It's like number one, you don't know how I pray, you don't know who my heroes are, who I look up to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a little girl who was, who grew up in Christianity, learning about Jesus, Jesus was my first teacher. And I still talk to Jesus this day. And there is no difference in what I learned from Geshikta and what I learned from Jesus. So the, the, it's the closed minded, the small mindedness and the, the bullying nature of, of people to not be willing to just listen and take in new experiences and to just make a judgment right off the bat that it really ticks me off. Yeah, I can hear, I can hear the frustration in your voice. I totally identify, understand. 
I think that exercising the spiritual principle of open-mindedness is not something that's necessarily taught to us. People feel very safe inside of their boxes, even if it causes other people harm. And I think that, you know, for people who have spiritual experiences, one of the main pieces of information that we come back with is do unto others as you would like done to you. And it can be very frustrating. I know that there's lots of channels out there where people are just super condemning. I've experienced that myself. And uh, I'm glad that our audience at IONS isn't quite that way. And just a shameless plug also for the, we have sharing groups here at IONS. So when people are feeling like they can't find spiritual community or people who understand them and they share their stories and nobody gets them. We have this great, awesome community where we meet online a couple times a week and we just share experiences with each other. And we're really like a family, like a spiritual family. So we just have these great conscious conversations with each other. And it's a true place of understanding. And a lot of us share our stories online and, and we get hit with the same backlash that you're talking about. And it's really challenging to be compassionate to people when they seem so close-minded. So I appreciate your honesty and your candor just talking about it because it is something that, you know, and I always think that it's so fascinating that they watch our whole story. <laughs> they watch the whole video just to talk, like just to talk down to us. It's so funny to me. I love it. Um, but I think like, that we're planting oh, seeds, you know? And you know what that really points to is they're curious, you know, because you can sit in a room and you can read a book all day long and have people tell you what what comes after this life and what what happens when we die and what happens you know etc in anything in a spiritual matter but the reality is this is a big wild wild and wide world and we don't have much of an idea of much of anything I mean, the more thing I, I know is that I don't know. Yeah. The more I experience, the more I realize I don't know Jack. Yes. I love that. And, you know, and yeah, when your perception is open to that, things shift. Things that I thought were true at the beginning of my spiritual awakening journey, I do not see that as truth anymore. And that's okay because I'm growing and evolving. And so my thoughts and belief systems, they grow and evolve with me. And again, that's practicing that spiritual principle of open-mindedness, which is one of my favorite ones. Um, I want to shift the conversation a little bit. I am totally obsessed with your artwork. I love your art style. And um, I'd love if maybe you could share a little bit about it. Were you an artist before your spiritual experience? And how did it shift after your spiritual experience? And while you're talking, I'm going to share the screen and just show some of your art as well. Okay. I, yeah, I was an artist before I had my near-death experience. I actually had been in college for a couple of years already. Well, yeah, almost two years when I um, had that experience. But what was funny is before I became an artist, I actually was planning on being a psychiatrist. So it's like, it all ended up mixing together. And, and now I'm a a weird version of a psychiatrist, I guess, and a, and still an artist. But how has it, how has my spirituality influenced it? You know, I would say my art has really been a, the expression of emotion. And creativity is a really important energy and the ability to express our emotions through creativity is paramount to having mental health. And I struggled with mental health from the time I was young because of the, the trauma that I went through. So art, what, before I even really knew anything about art, I had, you know, just pencil and, and sketchbooks and I would do my best to actually draw my emotions through faces, through portraiture. So from a young, very young age, I was really interested in how to express emotion through drawing. And that it's really stayed that way. It's still, it's still what I do. It's just, I would say that my, my emotional world, my spiritual world, all of that has matured. So what I, what I communicate through it is more mature at this point 
I love that. And I, yeah, there was one of your web pages are collaborations that you have with your children. Uh, and I think that that's so cool. And whenever I have a guest on that is a parent, I always ask about conscious parenting. What is it like to live in a world where you're a healer and you're a spiritual therapist and you have this great connection to the divine and you've had your own spiritual experiences? And how does that translate into being a mom? Well, so my children are 16 years apart. And I really feel that my second child, you know, got the the best end of that stick because when I was younger, you know, when I was pregnant with my first son, I was still going through what I spoke to you about earlier about being filled with lead. So his uh, gestation, his childhood was still me in a very fragmented state and my relationship with his father was incredibly dysfunctional and rough. So I did my, he was like, he was along for the ride of my spiritual process, my, my integration process. And my son now, which I still very much did my best to teach him what I was learning and to bring him into that world of of honesty and that that world of connection that I was cultivating and I very much also taught him to appreciate art he's an incredible artist and an incredible writer he's already written his first novel and my second son he has he just has a much more stable life I would say his I'm more stable my relationship with his father is more stable and more loving and he is you know the entire time I was pregnant with him I was uh, channeling this energy of Gashikta and teaching classes and helping people through their problems and so there's a clarity that was there's a clarity and a wisdom and a, a specific kind of power that was really transferred to him that is of great benefit to him and he's incredibly intelligent like very very intelligent in a, in a myriad of different ways one of which is his he has that ability to see the truth through all of the nonsense and and to understand human dynamics better than the majority of adults and he's he's quite amazing and I still with him also have brought him up in a very artistic setting. We homeschool him and he's he's an incredible artist already. He just won, a couple of years ago, he won first place in an art contest against kids that were quite a bit older than him. And well, as far as art is concerned, I really think that all children are good artists and, but it's not it's not encouraged and cultivated in them. And one, that's one of the things I'm really proud of as a parent is, is getting both of my boys to really explore that right away. And, and to, it's, it's actually always been kind of a required thing in the house is to, to be doing something creative. Like no one has ever really been allowed to just be lazy in terms of creativity. It's always um, been encouraged and just part of life to be creative and to create things that that help one be proud of themselves wow that is yeah it, it's such a shift well it's a shift from the way that I grew up anyway and I think that that's so beautiful and thank you for sharing and you know another thing that I took out of what you were sharing is that just because we have these profound spiritual experiences does not mean that our life goes perfect you know, like we're talking about challenges, challenges still happen. This is just one event in a whole lifetime of events. And sometimes it can sculpt us. I love how you shared about in the beginning of your experience. I love the imagery of seeing a fragmented version of yourself because that that is what it feels like. And until you find that glue to make you into that mosaic and, you know, it takes lots of 
like you talked about kind of this in, insatiable thirst for knowledge and really going out and trying to find your footing and and then the meeting of the mentor. And I really hear it as that hero's journey of coming into your own. And now you get to teach people. And I think that that's all so impressive. And it's not without the challenges of being a human. We still experience all of those things, difficulty in relationships and uh, death and disease and, you know, like all of these all of these human experiences that we have. So I really enjoy the the duality and the temperance of your experience talking about having one foot in the human world and one foot in the spirit world. And um, yeah, I'm wondering if there's anything else that you'd like to share, any other spiritual experiences or anything coming to your mind that you'd like to share with the audience? Not necessarily. It, I do think that it's important to, to realize that usually in, in the beginning of a spiritual awakening is especially when you come from a background with a lot of trauma, which so many of us do. The, it's not easy for a long time. And it, it certainly doesn't feel positive a lot of the time. And I think that that's, you know, for the culture, the spiritual culture today, one of the main things that I see that's bothersome is this focus on how everything has to be positive. And I think that ends up doing more damage than good because when you're healing the parts of yourself that are fragmented, that are broken, that are, you know, kind of stuck in time in, in trauma or you know, negativity, whatever you want to call it, if you ignore those for the sake of being positive, you're going to end up fragmenting even more and being even more screwed up. So there's a really important period of time when you really start deciding that pulling yourself together and and living a connected life is important. There's a there's a pretty good period of time that's going to be spent in difficulty and confusion and hardship and really doing your best to figure things out and that the best thing to do during that time is to, to learn to be present with yourself and all of the emotions that occur, all of the memories that may surface, and really work to actually figure things out and really work to learn how to become your own best friend instead of trying to force yourself into some fake positive perspective and mindset and, and all of that stuff. I think that can be very damaging. Mic drop. Yes. <laughs> yes, I love that. I, I agree. And I think that once you start to find the tools to really heal the underlying wounds, because we all have them, you know, you just said we all go through a lot of trauma, it doesn't even need to be trauma in our physical human lives. Being born is traumatic. Going through the birth canal is a trauma in, in itself. Um, you don't have to have had some super tangible traumatic experience to have experienced trauma. I, you know, I deal with people all the time that their kindergarten teacher ignored them when they raised their hand and that created some sort of ripple in their life that created all sorts of defects of character moving forward. So it doesn't have to be something huge. You know, I think that we all have wounds to heal and yeah, just shoving a, a bandaid of toxic positivity over an actual wound that really needs cleansing and healing is not going to be beneficial. Yeah. And in fact, it'll infect the wound more, which is exactly what I took out of what you were just saying. So thank you for that reflection. I'm so grateful for your willingness to come and serve our community and share your story and share your art with us and a piece of yourself. And yeah, I just want to thank you again so much and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for having me on.